Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ni Hui Niu, and welcome to today's tutorial. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, tutorial re regarding the topic uh, Liu Frontiers of Logic Graph Reasoning, Recent Advances, and uh, Future Trends. So this is the joint work with my collaborators uh, from uh, Hong Kong University of Science and uh, Technology. Uh, so they are Zhao Wang, uh, Jia Xinbai, Professor uh, Yang Chiu Song, and my advisor, uh, Professor Han Han Tong from UIUC. Uh, knowledge graph uh, is a graph structure data which used to represent the real world knowledge. And uh, each node in the knowledge graph can represent the real world object, concepts, and events, while the edges between different nodes uh, is used to represent their relationships. And the real world facts are represented as a triple S in the knowledge graph. So for example, uh, Paris is a city, Alice is friend of Bob are two facts in this knowledge graph. And there are wealth of knowledge graphs available online, such as uh, Yago, Wikidata, DBpedia, and so on. Usually these knowledge graphs are very large which contains uh, hundreds of millions of facts or, uh, or billions of facts. And uh, so they may contain like uh, several um, many uh, billions of entities and uh, hundreds of millions of entities. And knowledge graph has many applications. For example, uh, in computer vision, we can uh, organize the uh, person in the image uh, as a knowledge graph and use it to Help, help, uh, to help us identify the person in the image. Well, in recommender system, we can organize the user, user and all the items as a large graph and uh, use it to recommend the similar items. In question answering, we can uh, first transfer the question to a query graph and then use several graph matching methods to find answers in the knowledge graph. While in fact checking, we can organize all the information in the newspaper of the knowledge graph, and then you see that you check the truthfulness of the claim. And uh, uh, usually, knowledge graph reasoning means that we want to infer or discover new knowledge according to the existing information in the knowledge graph in response to a query. And uh, studying this problem is very important because it enables the model to learn from and uh, reason with structured, uh, structured knowledge graph data. And here we give an example. So give the incomplete knowledge graph uh, in the left-hand side of this slice. So the relationship between the entity, the love of Sam, and the tie is missing. Well, according to some other information in the knowledge graph, such as the entity, the love of Sam, has tagged Thailand, then we can infer that the movie, uh, the love of Sam, has language type. And usually knowledge graph reasoning methods can be categorized into three different uh, categories. So which are the uh, deductive reasoning, abductive reasoning, and uh, inductive reasoning. So for the deductive reasoning, it usually means that we want to apply the known rules, uh, which if, which given by the raw, uh, by the expert to derive the knowledge. So for example, uh, if we have the rules, like uh, A has person, A has some B, and B has some C, then we can infer that A is the grandfather of C. Well, for the abductive reasoning, it means that we want to choose the best explanation that explains an observation. So for example, if we observe A live with B, then one possible explanation is that A has spouse B. Well, for inductive reasoning, it means that we want to uh, use the patterns uh, in observations to derive knowledge. So for example, if we find a lot of patterns, such as A has some B and B has some C, and also A is a grandfather of C, then uh, one pattern we can uh, derive is that uh, has some in conjunction with has some uh, means is grandfather. And the knowledge graph reasoning uh, contains uh, three components which are the input uh, query Q, the reasoning uh, model F, and also the background uh, knowledge graph G. And each component will bring some unique challenges to the reasoning process. So for example, for the 
background knowledge, uh, usually the knowledge graph is very large. So uh, for example, the DBpedia contains uh, 4.6 million entities. So reasoning on such a large knowledge graph is time consuming. And also in many railroad knowledge graphs, uh, they are noise and uh, incomplete. So for example, half of entities in DBpedia only contain uh, less than five relationships. So how to reason on such an incomplete knowledge graph can be uh, difficult. Well, moreover, uh, most, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, all the railroad knowledge graphs evolves over time. So this will also bring some additional challenges. Well, for the reasoning models, uh, we know that uh, the relations in knowledge graph usually have many different uh, properties. So for example, some of, uh, some of the relations are symmetric, while some of the relations are anti-symmetric. So how to design a model which can support all these different uh, properties is difficult. And because the knowledge graph is large, so how to reason efficiently is also a challenge. And uh, uh, last but not the least, how to design a model which has a good uh, generalization ability uh, that can handle different and uh, new and same data effectively is also difficult. And last, from the uh, reasoning input perspective, so sometimes because the users might uh, uh, not familiar with the background knowledge graph, so they may ask uh, ambiguous questions. So for example, uh, for the question, John Little role in declaration independence. And here, the role, role in means uh, profession and occupation. Well, for the input uh, question, uh, Tom Jefferson role in declaration independence. Here, the role means a uh, film actor. So how do you handle this ambiguous query is also uh, difficult. And moreover, uh, the users might uh, um, interact uh, several rounds with the system. And these scenarios is very common in many real-world applications, so for such as in chatbot or the conversational question answering. So in order to uh, solve correctly answer the question, so the model not only needs to understand the current question, but also needs to uh, uh, keep the history conversation information. And to, in today's tutorial, we will uh, mainly introduce um, knowledge graph reasoning from the uh, following uh, six part. So uh, at the beginning, I will briefly introduce some basic uh, concepts and uh, techniques of knowledge graph reasoning. Then uh, my colleagues and I will introduce uh, some recent uh, advances related to knowledge graph reasoning. And finally, we will uh, briefly talk about the open challenges and uh, future uh, future directions. So uh, in the first part here, so for the basic concepts and the techniques, so I will introduce the following uh, four, four paths. So which are the knowledge graph embedding, the raw-based knowledge graph reasoning, the path-based knowledge graph reasoning, and also inductive rule mining. So now let's first say, uh, let's see the first part of knowledge graph embedding. Uh, usually knowledge graph embedding uh, means that we want to uh, reason, reasoning in the continuous space. So we want to project uh, each entity and uh, relation into a, a continuous vector space. And some methods include the tensor decomposition model, the uh, geometric model, and also the deep learning models. And the goal of logic graph reasoning is to encode entities as no dimension vectors and the relations as parametric algebraic operations uh, in the continuous space. And in order to achieve this, uh, usually we need to design a score function f, which uh, takes the uh, triplet input as uh, triplet embedding as the input and uh, assign a good score to the correct triplets, while assign a, a low score to the bad triplets. And a good embedding model should uh, capture different uh, uh, KG patterns, such as the symmetric, anti-symmetric, inversion, and composition, and so on. Uh, some applications of knowledge graph embeddings uh, include the uh, knowledge graph completion, question answering, recommender system, and so on. Uh, now let's briefly uh, introduce some uh, properties uh, in the knowledge graph. Well, the symmetric and anti-symmetric relations 
are the most uh, fundamental properties in the knowledge graph. And for the symmetric relation, so it usually means that uh, if a relation is symmetric, then uh, if X has a relation R with Y, uh, it means that Y will also has this relation with uh, X. So for example, marriage is a symmetric relation. So if X uh, get married with Y, then Y will also get married with X. Well, for the anti-symmetric relationship, one example is has children. So if X has children Y, then it means that uh, Y couldn't have children X. And another uh, property is the uh, inverse relations. Uh, some examples include the hyperlimb, hyperlimb for husband and wife. So usually if two relations, they are inversible. So it means that if X has the relationship uh, R1 with Y, then Y will has the relationship uh, R2 with X. So for example, if X is the husband of Y, then Y is the wife of X. And for the composition relationship, it usually involves three different relationships. So if R3 is the composition of R1 and R2, so it means that the head entity of R1 will be the head entity of R3, and the tail entity of R2 will be the tail entity of R3. So for example, if X has mother Y and Y has a husband Z, then X has father Z. And there are many different uh, large graph embeddings has been uh, proposed, and one of them is uh, trans C. So the goal of uh, trans C is to uh, embed each entity and the relation of the no dimension vector uh, in the embedding space. And their key idea is to model the relationship uh, R as a transition from the head entity and to the tail entity. So ideally, uh, if the triplet uh, HRT is correct, then we hope that the embedding of H plus the embedding of R will be equal to the embedding of T. Uh, one example is that uh, like in the bottom of this slide, we hope the embedding of uh, Tom Holland uh, plus the embedding of uh, nationality will be equal to the embedding of uh, British. And usually the distance function is uh, uh, defined as the distance between the uh, true tail entity and the ideal tail entity. And the score function uh, is naturally can be defined as the negative of the distance function. And during the training process, given a positive triplet, so usually we will sample a set of corrected triplets by randomly replace the head entity or the tail entity of the positive triplet. And we want to uh, minimize the margin-based uh, ranking loss function. So by minimize the loss, we can guarantee that the positive triplet will get a, a small distance while the uh, bad or the negative triplet will get a, a high distance. And uh, here, like in the bottom of this size here in this loss function, the gamma here is a parameter. It is used to guarantee that the gap between the positive triplet and the negative triplet should be uh, at least a gamma. Uh, now, so despite uh, the idea of trans is, is very simple, but uh, it can actually um, so model many different properties in the large graph. So for example, it can model the anti-symmetric relations. So as long as the embedding of the relation R is not equal to zero, then uh, if uh, H plus R is equal to T, then the T plus R won't be uh, equal to H. And moreover, it can model uh, inverse relations. So for example, uh, if H plus R1 is equal to T and T plus R2 is equal to H, then uh, we can uh, derive that the embedding of R1 is equal to the elective of the embedding of R2. And moreover, you can also uh, model the composition relations as long as the embedding of R3 is equal to the embedding of R1 plus the embedding of R2. But one thing is that uh, trans C could, mod could a lot of model the uh, symmetric relationships. So because if H plus R is equal to T and the T plus R is equal to H, then it means that the embedding of the relationship is equal to zero. And here we give uh, many, uh, like the properties of many different uh, large graph embedding uh, methods and also uh, so their timeline. 
due to the time limit, we only introduce their details. And uh, uh, interesting readers can check our references to uh, get more information. Uh, so after I introduce the logic graph embedding, let's say the uh, circular part, which are the raw based logic graph reasoning and also the path based logic graph reasoning. Well, one of the earliest uh, raw based reasoning uh, system is called uh, raw based expert system. So the idea is to apply the rules iteratively to generate uh, new facts. And uh, usually these new facts will represent the conclusions about the state of the domain. So given the observations, uh, usually the raw based expert system contains uh, three, uh, three parts, which are the uh, inverse engine, the logic basis, and also the rules uh, defined by the expert. And we can think of the inference engine is the brain of the system. And usually it will apply two, uh, two types of methods to infer the knowledge. So the first one is called uh, forward chaining, so which is uh, data driven. So usually uh, it means that uh, we are given a bunch of knowledges. So we want to apply the rules defined by the expert uh, iteratively to derive the new knowledge. And we repeat this process until uh, no rules can be applied. Also, no new knowledge can be uh, inferred. Well, the second uh, uh, type of ma uh, method is called the back of the chaining, which is uh, goal oriented. So here, given a goal or a query, uh, back of the chaining will uh, apply rules which uh, has a high correlation with the query, and then try to get uh, the uh, answer. Well, despite the raw based method is very accurate and very intuitive, but uh, one problem is that it requires the expert to give some rules. Well, in many uh, real world applications, we may don't have these rules. And also, uh, defining these rules is time consuming. Uh, so, uh, some researchers try to uh, like, uh, propose some path based reasoning methods. Um, and this, uh, this method usually uh, involves uh, traversing paths in a knowledge graph to infer new knowledge. So these paths can be uh, directed or undirected. And one of the earliest uh, path-based reasoning method is called a uh, uh, path ranking algorithm, so uh, which is short for PRA. But the idea of a PRA is that given a query, then the uh, algorithms will use random works to sample a bunch of uh, passes between two nodes. And then these passes will be treated as the feature of the, uh, the, the queries. And then they will, use a, a need, they will use a logistic regression models to uh, calculate, to predict the, the truthful score of the triplet according to these uh, uh, relations. And besides these uh, two algorithms, actually there are many uh, other methods have been proposed recently. So here we uh, give several um, examples and interesting readers can check our reference for more information. Um, so in the last part, I will introduce the inductive raw mining. Well, the goal of inductive raw mining is to uh, extract the, the general and the meaningful rules that can be applied to new and unseen data. So uh, the Raw mining based method has many advantages. So this is because the rules uh, has the potential to generalize well to new and unseen data. And moreover, the rules usually are much more explainable and uh, understandable. And for the raw based, uh, uh, for the raw mining algorithms, usually they contain two parts. So which are the uh, raw generation and the raw evaluation. So for the raw generation, uh, usually we want to I uh, use uh, raw mining algorithms to discover uh, many interesting rules from the data set. Well, for the raw evaluation, we want to uh, assess the quality of the uh, relevant, the relevance of the generated rules. So uh, one method um, which focuses on mining rules is called a uh, neural LP. So the goal is to learn the logical rules with a confidence score. And here, the, the score alpha is used uh, to deload uh, our beliefs related to the rules. Uh, related to the rules. So usually, if the uh, score alpha is large, then it means that uh, we have a uh, confidence that uh, this uh, raw is correct. 
So otherwise, we will think uh, um, we don't have too much confidence about uh, this ROS. And before we introduce the details of zero LP, uh, let's see another algorithm, which is called uh, TensorLog. So for TensorLog, uh, during the reasoning uh, process, usually uh, they formulated the reasoning process as a matrix multiplication. And uh, each entity in the knowledge graph is represented as a one hot vector, uh, as a one hot vector, where each matrix is represent, each relation is uh, represented as a matrix. And if the ith row and the jth column of the matrix is equal to one, so it usually means that uh, the entity i is uh, is collected with entity j uh, by these relations. So given a row like uh, R1 in, in conjunction with R2 uh, derives R3, and also the query uh, X has a uh, relation R3 with uh, which entity, the reasoning uh, process involves uh, some matrix multiplications. So such as we can multiply the one hot, uh, one, one hot vector of X with the uh, matrix of R1 and then uh, multiply it with the matrix of R2 to get uh, some results. And then we are retrieve all the entities whose entries are non-zero as the answers. And when the length of the row increases from two uh, from two to L, we simply uh, increase the multiplication uh, steps. So that the objective function here can actually be written uh, as the uh, for, as the equations given in the uh, middle of this size. And here we can see for the objective function is uh, uh, like a first. Uh, uh, submission and multiplication process. And in neural LP, the authors found that uh, uh, the first uh, summation and multiplication can be rewritten as the, um, yeah, the first uh, submission and then multiplication uh, can be, yeah, can be rewritten as the first uh, summation and then multiplication. And then this process can actually be uh, formulated by uh, recurrent neural networks uh, for T steps. And each step we want to use the recurrent neural networks to uh, learn the parameters alpha and the beta according to uh, the equations in box one. And then uh, for the final results, uh, we will use the equations in box two to uh, get uh, the results. But besides the, the chain row based uh, um, mining algorithms, some people recently tried to uh, use uh, subgraphs to uh, get some useful information. So uh, one algorithm is called a grill. So the idea is to, the idea is that, uh, so if the row is useful, then it must be contained in the subgraph around the uh, query triplet. So based on this idea, uh, in this work, they uh, propose the following uh, algorithms. So first, uh, given the query, which is uh, represented as uh, green edges um, in this size, and then they will find a subgraph around the query, which is shown uh, by all the red edges here. And after uh, we extract the subgraph, then in order to encode the structure information of the subgraph, the model will assign two numbers to each node in this subgraph. And uh, so these two nodes will be uh, used to denote their distance to the head entity and also the tail entity. And then uh, they will use uh, graph neural networks to uh, then the embedding for all the nodes in these double graphs and finally uh, predict the score for the uh, triplet, query triplet. Uh, now I have introduced the basic concepts and the techniques related to knowledge graph reasoning. So in the next part, I will uh, briefly introduce uh, our first uh, uh, recent advance related to knowledge graph reasoning, which is uh, neural reasoning for natural language queries. So in this part, I will introduce uh, the following two parts, which are the reasoning for multi-hop queries and also reasoning for conversa uh, conversational queries. And usually knowledge graph question answering means that uh, given a natural language question and uh, the topic entity and uh, a, a knowledge graph. So we want to find a set of loads or knowledge, uh, of the knowledge graph to answer the question. And in this part, we mainly focus on uh, answering multi-hop queries. So which can be transformed into a path in the large graph. So one example is uh, what's the language of the film directed by Steven Spielberg. And the uh, one thing we should notice is that uh, there are actually many different uh, types of uh, queries, such as the one-hop query, the logical query, and so on. 
And when answering the multi-hub queries, usually the knowledge graph in complete list will bring some challenges uh, because it will break the reasoning chain. And also, uh, if we simply increase the uh, reasoning path, the length of the reasoning path, it will increase the uh, computation complexity of the algorithm dramatically. So in order to solve these problems, uh, some people, they try to use some additional uh, data to help us find the correct answer, uh, such as uh, text cops. But one problem is that uh, the additional data might not exist uh, sometimes. So in order to uh, solve these problems in the uh, work embed KGQA, uh, the authors propose a method which uh, embed all the positions and also the entities of the knowledge graph into the same uh, vector space. And then they perform the question answering pro uh, process using these embeddings. So and this idea has uh, two benefits. So the first one is that it can deal with knowledge graph sparsity and incompleteness. And moreover, it can bypass the neighborhood limitations. And more specifically, the proposed embed KGQA contains uh, four steps in total. So in the first step, given a multi-hop natural language question, uh, a language model such as Robata will be used to uh, learn the representation of the question. And then in the second step, the knowledge graph embedding methods such as complex will be used to learn all the embeddings for the uh, entities in the knowledge graph. And in the third step, the answer scoring module will use uh, to assign score to all the entities in the large graph. And finally, uh, answer selection model will be used uh, to select all the entities with the uh, high score. And here we compile large graph completion with uh, embed KHQA. So for the large graph completion, uh, given the head entity, the relation, and also the uh, large graph, so we want to predict the, the tail entity. And in order to achieve this, we need to uh, choose a score function f, which will assign a good score to the correct triple S and uh, a low score to the uh, incorrect triple S. Well, for embed KGQA, so the input is the question, the topic entity, and also the knowledge graph. And uh, so we want to predict the missing uh, answer entities. And in these uh, works, they use a um, uh, they use an, a language model to encode the uh, natural language question and also choose a score function to assign uh, a score to all the entities in the knowledge graph. So uh, we can see that uh, there are many uh, correlations between the knowledge graph completion task and the question answering task. So one question we want to ask is uh, whether we can jointly learn these uh, two tasks at the same time. So, and the answer is yes. And we found that the knowledge graph question answering task can help us uh, complete the knowledge graph. So for example, given the uh, incomplete knowledge graph in the left-hand side of these slides, so we found that if we want to predict the answer, the tail entity for the partial triple add, a, lot, a song of love rain this year, then it's almost impossible to correctly predict the answer. Well, however, if we know the answer for the question, which year were all the films directed by Jean Janitor Renis? Uh, and we know the answer is uh, 1940, 1950, so that we can predict that the movie The Love of Sam M was released in 1950. And moreover, we also found that uh, logic graph completion can help us uh, improve the question answering performance. So, for example, given the question, what's the language of the film The Love of Sam? and the incomplete knowledge graph in the left-hand side of these slides. So we will find it's very hard to uh, find the correct answer. So however, if we can complete the knowledge graph, and then after the completion, the answer will, the question will become very easy to answer. And also from the theoretical perspective, so the goal of knowledge graph completion is to uh, maximize the probability that uh, find the tail entity T given the head entity H and the relation R1. Well, for the multi-hub question answering, the goal is to maximize the probability, uh, which contains uh, several, uh, the multiplication of several uh, terms. 
where each term has the same format as the logic graph completion task, so that if we can maximize the probability of uh, knowledge graph completion, we can also maximize the probability of multi-hop question answering and vice versa. So Nita, uh, Nita asked ask one question, whether we can jointly perform these two tasks in a mutually beneficial way. Well, in these works, uh, the authors uh, method the completion task and the uh, question answering task use the same shell, the embedding space, and the embedding space is pre-trained by the completion task. And then given a multi-hop question, uh, they will use a language model to encode the question into a path. And this path information is used to complete the background knowledge graph and also used to uh, further fine tune the embedding space. And the proposed model contains three paths in total. So in the first part, given, uh, given a question, the encoder part will be used to uh, transform the natural language question into a path. And then given the path, the answer scoring module will be used to find the K candidate answers uh, in the large graph. And finally, the answer refinement uh, module will use to rerun all the top candidate answers to get the final results. Well, in terms of if, uh, experiment, the author compiled the proposed method with different baseline method and defend that so the proposed method can achieve the state-of-the-art performance. And moreover, when the knowledge graphs become sparse, the proposed method outperforms baseline more. And when the length of the path becomes longer, the proposed method can also outperform baseline more. <clears throat> uh, now I have introduced uh, reasoning for multi-hop queries. In the next part, uh, I will introduce uh, reasoning for the conventional queries. Well, different from single round question answering, in conventional in conversational question answering, usually the users will interact with the uh, models for several rounds. And the questions in conversational question answering is usually very short and uh, uh, incomplete. So for example, uh, given the conversation in the right-hand side of this slide for question Q3, so we find that the question release, uh, release date so without the correct uh, conversation history information, we almost uh, couldn't know uh, what's the meaning of this question. And moreover, different from single uh, round uh, question answering, uh, usually when the user's uh, conversation with the systems, if the answers provided by the system is incorrect, uh, then the users will reformulate its original question and ask the system again. So while the answer retained by the system is correct, then the users will ask another question which has a new intent. So based on these two observations, uh, in this work, Conquer, the authors propose a uh, reinforcement learning based uh, conversational question answering methods. So the idea is uh, they, uh, they, so the idea is that uh, the agent, the reinforcement agent will receive a positive reward if the next question uh, is a new intent. Well, if the next question is a reformulation, so it means that the answer uh, provided by the system is incorrect, so the agent will receive an active reward. Well, most specifically uh, in the first part, so given a question, uh, the context entity detection uh, module will be used to find all the entities related to the current question and also is conversational uh, context. And then uh, these entities will be treated as the start points of the uh, reinforcement learning reinforcement learning work. Then start from these points, uh, the agent will travel the knowledge graphs to find the correct answers. And this process can be formulated as a Markov decision process. Well, the state is the current question, the context entity, and also the conversation history. And the actions are all the outgoing paths from the a complex entity node. And the reward is one if the next question is a new intent, is minus one if the next question is a reformulation. And after we use multiple agents to find the answers, then in the last part of the answer generation module will be used to rank all these answers. And usually if multiple agents will achieve the same 
uh, same entities, then these entities will have the high probability uh, that is the correct answer. Uh, despite the reinforcement learning based method is very intuitive, but uh, some problem is that uh, usually these paths are very uh, similar. So it's very hard to distinguish uh, which path is correct. And uh, besides the reward is usually very sparse, it makes the model very hard to train. So in order to solve these two problems in this paper, Praline, so they propose a contrastive learning based method to uh, rank all the knowledge graph paths uh, for retrieving the correct uh, answers effectively. So the idea is to uh, trade all the paths which can lead to the post leads to the correct answer as the positive uh, data and all the other paths as the negative data. And also during the re uh, during the training process in order to enrich the learning process, uh, so they also uh, use some other information such as the entire dialogue history, the verbalized answers, and the domain information to uh, train the model. And most specifically in the great processing step, given the conversation history and the current uh, questions, um, so the model we are uh, extracting some uh, candidate passes use the uh, previous reinforcement learning based method. And then each pass is treated uh, as a sentence. And uh, so they will use a language model such as BERT to learn the embedding for each pass. And then uh, given the uh, conversation context information, uh, so they will use a BART model to encode both uh, the conversational history and also the question at each turn to learn the context embedding. And besides that, they also use a BART, uh, BART model to generalize the verbalized answers for each entity answers. And finally, during the contrast learning uh, steps, given a bunch of uh, conversational context and the knowledge graph paths found uh, during the training process, so they will learn the uh, conversation context embedding and also the domain embedding according to step two, and then all the path embedding according, according to step one. And during the training process, they want to maximize the similarity between the correct pairs while minimizing the uh, similarity for all the incorrect pairs. And for the uh, experiment, they compiled proposed method with many different baselines and finally they can achieve the state of the art performance. So now I have introduced the basic concepts and also the uh, first part that the reasoning for natural language questions. Uh, in the last part, uh, my colleagues, uh, so how we are introduced uh, the uh, second uh, recent advance. Uh, so now let's welcome uh, Zhao. Hello, Okay. Uh, it does not work very well. Oh, oh okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Wang Zihao from Hong Kong UST. And I'm very happy to uh, present the third part, uh, the newer reasoning for logical queries. Okay. Uh, so uh, roughly we have the first half and second half of the tutorial. And in the first half, uh, I'm the uh, last part of the first half, we will focus, uh, focus on entity-based KG. And in the second half, we will focus on the text attribute and more advanced knowledge graphs and also the large language models. Okay, so uh, now let's begin the uh, logical queries. So uh, I think we have a wonderful introduction about how to solve natural language queries uh, in their part. 
the neural model will do majorly two things. The first thing is that we need to understand what is the meaning of the natural language. And the second part is how do we reason with the logic underlying the natural language and uh, to derive the answers in the knowledge graph. And in this part, we just focus on a simplified setting. That is, we already know the logical structure of the question. And this is not a, a very hard uh, for now because we have large language models so that we can thoroughly understand natural language. Okay, here is an example about the natural language and the logical query. So in the natural language form, uh, we, we have several queries like find the non-American directors whose movies won Golden Globes or Oscars. And we can see that this sentence uh, is uh, apparently some uh, database query or logical query. And here is the logical form. And we can see that there are some basic elements like predicates, uh, for example, one, uh, or in, or direct. And also there are some entities like Golden Globes, Oscars, and America. And also uh, there are variables like X, I, and Y. Well, we switch to laser point. Oh, okay. Okay, ah, this is better. And also we have the quantifiers, like uh, the X, X1 is quantified by an existential variable and we want to get the values of Y. So here uh, in, in, in this problem, uh, we have a very classic setup with logical query, which is usually existential first order. That means we only have existential variable and the language is first order. And this kind of query is well studied in the database literature. But what is different here is that we are studying knowledge graph. So uh, the key difference is that the underlying knowledge graph KG uh, can be incomplete and noisy. So uh, basically we always have an enriched KG in our mind. That is, we can get from the link predictor or other knowledge graph embedding or reasoning uh, models we have introduced in the first part. Okay, so uh, now let's go a little bit deeper into the definition. So for the logical query here, uh, we can always organize it into the UCQ query, which is the unions of conjunctive queries. So what is that? That means uh, we can always write a query into the disjunction of multiple conjunctive query. In this example, um, we can find the answer set of Q uh, as the set union of two conjunctive queries. And Y here is the free variable. That is what we want to know. Here is the uh, director and XI here uh, is the existentially quantified variables that we don't actually care about the values. Okay. And for each conjunctive query, uh, it is the conjunction of multiple atomic formulas, A, J, K here. And uh, uh, we can see in this example, uh, the atomic formula always have three parts. Uh, it can be positive or it can be uh, negative and uh, it will have a relation. Uh, it is the binary relation in KG. And uh, of course, in the database setting, it can be a multi-area relation. And also they have two terms, the TS and TO. They are subjective and objective terms, respectively. And each term can be either an entity, like the Golden Globes here, or the America, or the variable, like Y or XI. And after we have the definition of logical query, uh, we want to define what is the answer of a query. So uh, firstly, um, the answer set of a query is all the entities satisfying such condition. That is when we substitute the answer A to the Y, uh, we will evaluate this kind of logical sentence over the knowledge graph and we get the true answer. Okay, so what is the substitution? Let's consider still the case. When we substitute A to Y, we remove this free variable and we will substitute all the occurrence of Y with the known entity or the testing entity A so that we get a sentence without any free variable. That is, it will have a precise meaning of true or false, even the knowledge graph. Okay, so how to evaluate this? Then it comes to a very classic model checking problem. That is, we can uh, substitute all the y's here into the atomic formula here and keep all those logical structures unchanged. And in the uh, database setting, where the and uh, where we assume the knowledge graph is complete uh, and the atomic formula is true, even only if there is a triple in this kg. And in our setting, we 
consider it conceptually enriched KG. And we can say that, um, okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. So in our setting, uh, because we are caring about the page that is incomplete, so uh, basically we have conceptually an English page of uh, page and uh, and the commentary to define we can find triple in the English page. Okay, so now uh, let's state the goal of our study of logic queries. That is, uh, we only care about we observe KG, everything is single. We can use a mystic algorithm to get the answer. But if we want to care about the enriched page, how to enter the loop of the incomplete page? Now, uh, let's begin with the first strategy. That is, because we have a lot of models focusing on how to complete the page, and then we can use some hybrid approach. Firstly, enriched page, and secondly, uh, search the answer. Okay, uh, to begin with, uh, we will introduce some related concepts in fuzzy logic. Uh, that is, we have a link predictor, uh, which is the abstraction of a lot of KG embedding model. Uh, it will uh, predict a value between zero to one uh, using the function f, uh, which we always assume is differentiable. And it is used as the truth value of an atomic query. That is, given this atomic query uh, or atomic formula, we have whether it is true or not, or to what extent it's true. For example, if the predicted answer is 0 0.5, then it's hardly true. And also there are several fuzzy logic operators like t norm and t Um, uh, They are basically to transfer uh, the computation of logical conjunction to the computation of the truth values. Uh, you can see that when we switch the order of the truth value and the logical conjunction, uh, it is the T uh, T norm, and also we have the T core. And here are two examples of the T norm and T core. For example, we can use min and max. This is the most favorite one. And also uh, we can use the product. Okay. And also for the negation is quite standard. For example, if we want to negate some uh, formula, and we just use one to minus its truth value. Okay. Now, uh, the evaluation problem of TVQ will just be, become uh, some basic logical calculus. That is, we will first do the substitution of y equals to a into here to each atomic formula. And then we will just convert every logical connected and also the logical uh, quantifier into this T norm and T form formulation. Okay, so uh, then we will talk about how to calculate that. So the first version is the first straightforward or brutal first uh, brutal force version. That is when this t component is a Godel t component. That means it's a maximum. So that if we want to evaluate whether uh, for this query q y equals to a is the answer or not, we will just search for all possible x1 to xn in their embedding space, uh, in their set of embedding, and evaluate the objective. And of course, uh, this is a very intuitive search problem, and the complexity goes to uh, exponentially with the number of variables. And uh, of course, this problem can be simplified under some certain version. For example, uh, if the query graph, here we mean the nodes of variables, and the nodes are connected through the atomic formulas. Uh, when this kind of graph is a tree, uh, the complexity can be drastically simplified uh, because we can remove each variable uh, in the quadratic complexity of the entity set, and all this uh, computation can be finished uh, into linear time uh, in terms of the number of variables. And uh, there are some well-established well words uh, focusing on this direction. And there are also some interesting techniques. For example, uh, if we consider the search problem over 
uh, the atom set, we can further simplify it by the embeddings. Uh, we do not search over the discrete sets, we search over the embedded space. So uh, if the objective is differentiable, then we can optimize this problem through gradient descent. And uh, uh, so that we can save a lot of time. And also uh, this formulation is uh, for each possible answer A. And uh, that means uh, we have to solve this problem multiple times if we want to test the multiple answers. And there is a simplified version, uh, which is we will add the uh, embedding of Y into the search process so that we can estimate the optimum X1 and Xn and use the same set of X1 to Xn uh, to uh, evaluate all different ones. Uh, this is the uh, method called CQD uh, continuous. Okay. And after the continuous search, uh, I would like to further extend this method to the uh, learn to optimize version. That is, uh, we want to skip the gradient descent and estimate the variables with neural networks. So here we will consider a simplified version, which is the uh, conjunction queries. But this simplification is good because all queries we are interested in should be considered as uh, unions of conjunctive queries. That means if we can solve each conjunctive query properly, uh, we can then combine everything together using the union operation to get a final answer. So uh, for example, we consider a uh, conjunctive query here. We, are, we only have conjunctions, but we can have negation and also the existential and free variable. And in the optimization form, uh, we have just introduced we will optimize X and Y to maximize this objective. And uh, instead of using this, we want to go to some neural models. Here we consider graph neural networks. That means we have to build a graph. Here we consider the graph of entities, variables, and all the atomic formulas. So uh, let's restate our goal. Uh, we don't want to optimize the invariance of X, or, uh, X and Y. And we want to use the four types of neural networks to estimate all the embeddings. So how to do that? Uh, one way is that uh, we don't need to uh, optimize the global objective. Instead, we want to optimize the local objective. Uh, that means the objective by uh, different edges in the graph. For well, here is the F A R one X only, and one minus F B R two X only, and F X R three Y only. Uh, they are optimized separately. So they are reduced to the so-called uh, one half inverse problems. Uh, here we just optimize one uh, variable here. And of course, if we lose some uh, accuracy, we will only consider this partial objective. But uh, fortunately, uh, people show that uh, we have this kind of closed form uh, for different kinds of link predictors. And so that we can have this kind of summarization. Uh, this is a message function. Uh, it will have four inputs. The first one is entity and relation. Uh, that's quite usual when we consider not graph. And also it can model the direction, whether it's head to tail or tail to head, or whether it's negated or not. So basically uh, we have the closed form function for all the three subproblems. And uh, uh, once the message function can, are well defined, we can define a GN layer by passing a message and then using the L, MLD aggregate. So uh, we can further use the uh, define GN layer to be uh, identical across different layers. And we reuse the layer uh, for multiple times and the number of layers will be the diameter of the paragraph so that we match all the information. And we can use the existing uh, retrained not graph embedding uh, and also some special tokens. And by the end to end training, we can estimate X and Y uh, using GFN. Okay, so uh, after the first strategy, we want to talk about the second one. And actually, the GNL method is already an end to end training. And now uh, let's talk about a little bit more uh, for the second strategy. That is, uh, we don't want to uh, care about the enriched case. We just want a good model. When we train this neural model on the queries and the answers we obtain in the observed case, 
and we want to use the generalizability of machine learning model to predict the answers in the enriched PT during the inference. Okay, uh, then it will goes to how to design neural networks to achieve this goal. And uh, in our talk, we will just separate uh, different neuralization into three levels, depending on how strong they are related to logical forms. So the first one, the weakest one, uh, will be the sequence model. It will just consider the uh, sequence of neural networks, oh, sorry, of the logical pairs, and you can use transformer to do that. But it has very weak connection uh, to the uh, to the logical operation. And uh, for GNN, uh, it considers the graph uh, of terms and predicates. So it has a mid level. So uh, we are here talking about the third one. It has a very strong connection uh, to the process of solving the logical problem. And this also aligns with uh, Li Hui's definition about conversational curve, where we have very short updates of each logic formula and we convert it into the small operation. And then we get the answer. So uh, still look at this example. Uh, we can convert the, uh, convert this logical query into the uh, set operations. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if we want to uh, have x1, and instead of search, uh, we just use the embeddings uh, to estimate x1 from the bullet globes and all stars. And here is the projection function. Uh, we can use this kind of projection function to estimate the intercept of bullet globes and all stars. And we use the set union to merge them. And also, uh, we use the movie to estimate their uh, director. And meanwhile, uh, we can use the first place to find some people and use the set complement to exclude them. And then use the conjunction to merge everything together to get the intercept. OK, so uh, let's. Uh, summarize the procedure we just defined below. But before. Uh, we have already the entity set, the relation set of the KG. And also, uh, we have a very natural function from the uh, entity to the entity embeddings. Uh, here we use Y for the space of entity embed. And also, uh, for each query, we have the space of query embed. So, uh, also, we want to design uh, the query embedding for the set embedding. So the entity embedding and the uh, how sets are interact. For example, we have the uh, set intersection, union, complement, projection, and also how we evaluate uh, whether an entity is our answer using this scoring function. So we have seven elements to design. And now uh, we are, have a further example to elaborate how this happened uh, in the uh, neural space. So here is an example, uh, if we want to find a common symptom of two diseases, D1 and D4. So what we're going to first is that, um, beginning with D1 and D4, uh, we look at the embedding in the embedding space. So those two blue points. And then we use the uh, set projection to find all related symptoms. And we have two uh, yellow points here. And we use the intersection to get the joint feature. And then we use the scoring function to uh, to score all the entities uh, to measure how they close to the answer. And I can find the second one uh, exactly uh, you know, in my example uh, is the answer. Okay, so now let's discuss how to achieve all those uh, stuff in an embedding space. Um, let's begin with the simplest one, which is the uh, vector space in the uh, which is the vector in the Euclidean space. That is all the set and query, all, all the query set and answers are vectors. And uh, the set projection is realized by just the matrix multiplication. And RR is a matrix indexed by relation R. And also the measurement is by the cosine similarity. And uh, uh, we don't need to actually care about the union because we can solve the UCQ query uh, as long as we can handle the uh, intersection. And for the intersection, it can be quite intuitive because everything is neural. So we can just use the deep set. Uh, and, and in this, it's a realization of the set. Uh, you will uh, transform each embedding and use the permutation invariant of major lab. Summation or maximization, and then uh, use the transformation. Okay, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not very intuitive. 
to present the that Okay. And an enhancement in Euclidean space is that uh, we can use multiple vectors to represent the set. By using multiple vectors, we can enrich the uh, space of parameters. And uh, because we have uh, multiple vectors for a set, uh, it allows us to use more advanced neural networks, such as self-attention and uh, gates when designing intersection, uh, complements, or projection. And also, most importantly, because we have multiple vectors for a set, we can just merge all the vectors into a longer, uh, into a larger set to represent the set unit. And uh, uh, ignoring some uh, details, uh, this kind of in intuition or this kind of heuristics works pretty well uh, in many unit settings. And uh, after the vectors, we can also talk about some uh, other embeddings like geometric embedding. Uh, here are the boxes of accent example. Um, where all the entities are still vectors, but all the queries here are in the box. So that uh, we can use the, um, whether a vector is covered by a box, use this kind of intuition to, to demonstrate whether an entity is the answer. So the intersection of two answer sets are visualized or are intuitively explained by uh, the intersect the, the overlapping of two boxes. So uh, when we do the intersection, we just want to estimate the intersected boxes. So uh, for, for each box, we uh, only need to define uh, an additional parameter. Uh, we need to define the center of the box and also the width of the box. And unfortunately, this kind of intuition does not work pretty well on the set complement because uh, if we consider a vector space, uh, the box itself is convex, but the complement of this convex zoom is not convex, that is, of course, not a box. Okay, an improvement here is that um, we may use uh, the uh, more advanced probabilistic distributions to uh, demonstrate, uh, to, to, to realize the set complement. Uh, the beta distribution is an example. Uh, so the beta distribution here is defined also by two factors, uh, alpha and beta. And from here, we can see that if we just take the inverse of both alpha and beta, uh, we will have a different shape of the distribution. Um, so for example, here beta 2, 2, uh, we'll have a, a bell-like shape, and uh, beta 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is another shape. Uh, they are totally different, and they look like uh, to be the complement. Okay, so uh, for, for other operations, they are uh, basically uh, same. Uh, for example, the intersection is also uh, some aggregation uh, of neural networks to estimate the parameters, and uh, uh, for the projection is also realized by a neural network. Uh, it's an MLT indexed by the relation. Okay, so uh, after talking about so many intuitions to design embedding, uh, but remember we are still talking about logical queries, so uh, our question is, can we still make those embedding logical aware? Um, so here, uh, I, I will first talk about some uh, logical intuitions and then go back to how this kind of intuition can, uh, can instruct our design, uh, can guide our uh, design of the embeddings. So uh, let's uh, forget about how to realize them in, in, in the embedding space and focus on basic concepts. Here we have a matrix and QA. The first index Q is a query and the second index A is whether an entity A is the answer of Q. So TV represents the truth value. So, um, so all we do is just to evaluate this kind of matrix. Uh, to answer each query, we just need to access one row of the matrix. And Q is the arbitrary query, so that SQA, the scoring function we mentioned in the embedding space, uh, is also uh, can be looked up in, the, in, in this matrix. But the problem is that uh, MQA looks very large so that uh, we cannot actually report them. But luckily, uh, we can focus on a subset of this, uh, this matrix. Uh, if we restrict the set of all queries into the set of all positive atomic queries, like head relation to pair, then this matrix is much, much smaller. And uh, only this part is necessary, and other rows can be generated by the physiological calculation, like T norms or T norms we mentioned before. Okay, so, uh, uh, if we only consider this kind of matrix, then we consider this kind of matrix decomposition. 
uh, where this matrix is decomposed into Q and A. And Q is the querying value of the atomic query here. And uh, uh, of course, uh, if we assume uh, every relation has an inverse relation, uh, we can use uh, this one formulation to cover everything. Okay, so still, uh, like all other matrix decomposition algorithms, uh, this kind of matrix decomposition also yields the entity value, which is exactly the A. And if we further assume that every Q and A are uh, in the range like this, uh, they are fuzzy values, so that uh, we can apply a linear T for convenience, we consider the global T. And we will find that if we want to evaluate uh, this matrix of the row of Q1, conjunctive of Q2, uh, which is we want to evaluate the uh, embedding of this conjunction query, uh, it is basically uh, the conjunction of two rows and using the minimum. And luckily, uh, we still apply this matrix decomposition. Uh, we have this kind of minimum. And of course, because T nodes are linear, uh, we assume the minimum here, and we will get uh, the minimization of two vectors. And we will see that if we want to apply this kind of rules, we can just use multiple T nodes elementwise um, to set in values. Okay, then it is the uh, uh, a better performing uh, query embedding. Uh, we can see that for the intersection union and conjunction and, and that complement, uh, which puzzles people a lot before, uh, it can be directly uh, just T nodes. Uh, this is the observation we have just done. Okay, so uh, uh, and, and for the set projection, uh, you can just use MLP uh, because uh, we have so strong assumption about the union intersection complement, so that we have to use the nonlinearity of neural networks. And of course, uh, this is the matrix decomposition form, and this is a very good word. Okay, and after that, uh, we will also consider an improvement here. Um, so once we use the genome decomposition, we are subjecting to the matrix composition, uh, which is the pairwise com uh, comparison, because uh, in the as a QE here, uh, we will use a inner product. And uh, the intuition like the purge box are missing. So we want to use the regions uh, and the vectors, the relationship between them to demonstrate whether a set is in the uh, region or not. Okay. So uh, now there are some models uh, emphasizing both in local and global comparison. Uh, they have a better objective to, 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 to consider the uh, scoring function. Okay, so uh, now we go to the end of the uh, set operations. So basically, uh, the set operation uh, has a very natural decomposition for the logical computation. Uh, it can be used in a conversational uh, question answering. And uh, of course, the choices of the operators can be different because we can uh, use set difference to replace the set complement. Uh, they are logically the same, the, the same. And also there are some uh, equivalent forms like we can uh, conduct the unions first and intersection uh, next, and also uh, vice versa. Okay, and uh, the design of the embedding space is kind of interesting because uh, we have a lot of good intuitions in the existing study of knowledge graph embeddings, and we can bring them together. And also, um, when we train this uh, neural networks, uh, it, it is not well discussed here. Uh, for now, uh, the, tr the training is very uh, simple, and the in inference is also very efficient compared to the search algorithms, because um, we're using the fixed dimension embedding space, so that when the graph grows, uh, if we already have the, a, a training embedding, uh, the speed of the inference is very, uh, is just in the fixed dimension, so it will not grow with data. And also, uh, we have a very uh, usually we have efficient uh, nearest the neighbor uh, algorithm to look at the value uh, in the sublinear complexity. And for the training, um, now all, all the training is almost done by uh, sampling negative samples, no matter it's partial or we consider all negative samples. And uh, recent works also introduces meta learning to help to help improve the generalizability uh, in different kind of types. And the key takeaway is that 
you, you don't need to consider the uh, models as a uh, integral. Uh, you can you can consider uh, different operators. Okay, so uh, uh, so here is a, a short summary. Um, we have talked about two strategies, and the first one we begin with the rigorous uh, fuzzy logic, and we complete this graph and search, and uh, we can solve all the existential first order problems. And in our second strategy, we majorly talk about the set operators. They are neuralized, and uh, they can solve the queries that can be expressed in trees. Uh, for convenience, we call it tree form query or TF query in, in, in this tutorial. And people usually assume that those queries are simple. They claim that if we can solve the tree form queries and we can solve the EFO queries. And is this true? Okay, uh, here are some recent discussion about this. Query. So uh, to define, uh, to, to, to discuss whether they are the same, we have to first define what is the queries that can be expressed in trees. So here, um, for all the query families, uh, like the TF query, TTF query, um, it has several uh, components. The first one is the common query, has relation with predicted tail, and also there are set operations like uh, projection, complement, intersection, and union. And we can uh, define, uh, we can find a formal definition of this kind of tree family. So first of all, we begin with all atomic queries. And for the separate projection, uh, it can be written formally here. Um, for any TF query, uh, if we just um, start from Z and use another projection uh, to find the variable Y, it's also a TF query. And also for the negation, if we apply a set complement or logical negation outside any TF query, still a TF query. And uh, this recursive definition still goes well with the uh, set intersection and set union, and you can find that um, any intersection of two TF queries is a TF query. And any union or, or any disjunction of two TF queries is a TF query. So, um, and, and we have to assume that uh, the variables in, in both sides are not intersect because they are trees. Okay, so uh, basically this is the formal definition of TF query. And uh, to compare it with the uh, definition of EFO query, we can find they are quite different. So, uh, so the, the EFO query here uh, is recursively defined in the form of, form of logic. And there are some key differences. The first one is that uh, the, the negation in EFO query only applies to atomic formulas, while in the TF query it applies to any. And also, um, when, they, when the query grows, the TF query will assume uh, there are no intersection of two subtrees. The, the, the variables will not overlap. And in the EFO query, the variables can overlap. So this is fundamentally different. And that will uh, become to, to a conclusion. Uh, that is, we can always find a query that is TF, but not EFO. And we can also find a query that is EFO, but not TF. So uh, here is a recent discussion about whether those two query uh, families are overlapped or not. So we can see that there are some part of the TF queries that are not EFO, and there are a very large part of EFO queries that are not TF. So, uh, but, but we will not go to the details. Okay, so uh, here is the summary of my part. So uh, we want to solve the logical queries that we all studied in databases into the knowledge graphs uh, with the uh, incomplete data assumption. And we have several methods to solve. And specifically, we have two strategies. The first, we will complete uh, the knowledge graph. And then we conduct the logical inference. And secondly, uh, we will use the mixture of completion and the logical inference. And we have many forms of interesting model like the uh, set union. Uh, but we also have some uh, interesting discussion about whether uh, about the query families can be solved in different strategies. And um, uh, I still also want to uh, summarize that uh, all the methods we have discussed is still far away from the sparkle level uh, complexity or the sparkle level expressiveness because uh, there are some key features that are still missing. First of all, all the uh, methods are developed for, uh, in particular, those uh, 
that operation algorithm in the embedded space are designed for the single variable. And there are also many scenarios when we care about uh, a pair of answers where we have multiple variables in the query. And uh, there are uh, a recent data set about it. And uh, uh, no, no one model are focusing on this now. And also um, some very important operators in the databases are not yet discussed, like counting, or you, you find the distinct uh, entities, or you want to store the entities with the values. And there are some uh, different uh, kind of new tasks in the development. Okay, so uh, this is my part. And uh, originally we plan to uh, begin the second part in the uh, 11 a.m. I'm not sure whether we wish to. Okay, maybe we'll have a coffee break for half an hour and we will begin uh, in 10 Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, in the second half of the tutorial, uh, I'm gonna start from uh, introducing some reasoning uh, knowledge was about uh, uh, more than entities and event, uh, uh, entities and the relations, particularly on events and intentions. And uh, this uh, part uh, will be split into two. So uh, basically, uh, I will introduce the first one, and then uh, Jiaxin will introduce the second one. So uh, before talking about uh, knowledge about reasoning uh, beyond entity and the relations, uh, we should revisit uh, what are knowledge uh, graphs and what are the potential uh, information inside the knowledge graph and the scope of the knowledge. So uh, knowledge could be awareness of facts. So this can, uh, this can be uh, just a, a factual knowledge like uh, the traditional triples in uh, knowledge graph, like the population of Singapore. And then um, knowledge could be also practical skills, and those are related to uh, procedural knowledge or script knowledge. So uh, those are really uh, usually uh, used to solve uh, how uh, how like questions, like how to have a bees. So this kind of knowledge uh, usually involve multiple uh, events uh, inside the process, and also we want to understand the consequences of events and the reasons of the events. And also, uh, knowledge can be coming from uh, experiences. So, for example, uh, when you uh, after you tasted uh, during, you will be able to know the taste of it. And also, uh, these kind of knowledge are um, usually uh, highly related to our common sense knowledge about the world. So, uh, talking about the common sense knowledge, uh, we actually studied common sense knowledge in AI for a long time. So, basically, back to John McCarthy, uh, they uh, already thought about what are uh, common sense knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> so in John McCarthy's uh, definition, uh, it refers to uh, facts about events and their uh, effects, facts about their uh, be uh, facts about beliefs and desires, and facts about uh, objects and their properties. So as you can see that <clears throat> the common sense knowledge are uh, related to all the semantic units that we can define the world rather than just entities and their, and their relations. But uh, this is particularly uh, very difficult to uh, be modeled. <clears throat> so uh, people in the past detoured to some kind of uh, simpler representations of the knowledge. In the very famous uh, uh, knowledge graph called ConceptNet, they defined the common sense knowledge as millions of basic facts and understandings possessed by uh, most people or ordinary people. And this kind of uh, common sense knowledge are usually omitted in our daily communications. But somehow we have to understand them to uh, to communicate uh, with each other. So, for example, uh, if you forget some uh, someone's birthday, then they may be unhappy with you. Right? This this is really a kind of a social interaction, and you should experience it uh, before uh, you know it. However, this kind of knowledge uh, may not be invariably true because there are always exceptions. For example, when I claim. Uh, uh, people are always uh, bigger than dogs. Uh, this might not be true for some of the dogs. So uh, given those uh, definitions and scopes of the knowledge, uh, we would uh, uh, talk about uh, the development of knowledge graphs uh, to cover those uh, related knowledge. In fact, in the past few years, uh, knowledge, uh, the development of knowledge graph has been 
much or mostly changed by uh, the development of deep learning and uh, NLP. Uh, particularly uh, for large language models, uh, we observed that many kind of knowledge graph construction and reasoning uh, can be uh, changed by large language models. Uh, because large language models are uh, very good at uh, reasoning and understanding uh, uh, like humans' natural language uh, variabilities and ambiguities. But on the other hand, uh, we still want to build a knowledge graph because our knowledge has structures. And also uh, we want to fix those knowledge in a uh, database so that when, whenever we want to retrieve those knowledge, we have a very uh, concrete and uh, uh, referred uh, uh, precise uh, knowledge that we can actually use for uh, uh, generation. So given this, um, we would like to review the recent development of knowledge graphs that is beyond the entities and relations. In fact, uh, Luna uh, Dong, uh, who is a true expert in knowledge graph, uh, um, uh, divide the development of knowledge graph in three generations. She actually led a, a team at Amazon uh, building uh, Amazon product knowledge graph, and she was also a key member uh, in Google knowledge graph. So she uh, really knows uh, how uh, the well the industry of knowledge graph uh, how it evolves. So basically, uh, in her summarization, uh, she divided the knowledge graph development in three generations, uh, namely uh, entity-based knowledge graphs, uh, text-rich knowledge graphs, as well as dual neural knowledge graphs. Uh, but uh, I would rather add two other dimensions beside, uh, besides this, because um, as you can see, the categorization of this uh, is uh, kind of a just based on uh, what's inside the world the surface form of the knowledge graph's differences. But semantically speaking, or uh, kind of uh, uh, essentially, what are those knowledge graph differences are uh, kind of uh, amazing. So the first dimension I would like to add is um, the semantic units that we can actually use uh, to build the knowledge graph. Obviously, uh, you can use entities and relations and uh, uh, attributes or concepts and properties and so on, right? Uh, to construct a traditional knowledge graph. Uh, but of course, you can also use uh, processes, these uh, events, uh, states, and their relations uh, to build the knowledge graph. And also, more interestingly, maybe we can also include intentions, desires, and beliefs, uh, where beliefs could be uh, even false beliefs about something, right? To build our knowledge graph about the world. Mm. The other dimension is that we should align our knowledge graph development with the development of web uh, webs, because um, uh, uh, as you can see, the development of web is really uh, uh, along with the semantic networks, and also there's a lot of uh, interesting features and properties uh, in uh, different versions of the webs. And of course, uh, if we can align with the different uh, versions of webs, uh, knowledge graphs could also uh, serve more, much more functions and uh, represent more uh, semantic information uh, to facilitate a, a lot of uh, applications. So to study uh, the, this kind of uh, categorization, uh, uh, we start from the entity-based knowledge graphs, uh, where we have a lot of uh, traditional uh, knowledge graphs, including uh, Google Knowledge Graph released in 2012. And also, uh, besides it, uh, there are many uh, commercial knowledge graphs, including Microsoft Satori, and also um, uh, some kind of non-profitable knowledge graphs like Freebase. And uh, inside those knowledge graphs, as you can see, there are many kind of uh, like tens of millions of entities and tens of billions of uh, relations. Uh, but still, uh, the study showed that uh, there's a lot of entities and relations made. So basically, those uh, uh, entity-based knowledge graphs are all uh, uh, aligned with uh, 1.0 because um, they're not user-centric and they're not uh, kind of blockchain-based. They're just uh, uh, extracted from uh, the web pages or the uh, like uh, uh, collected from expert uh, annotations. <clears throat> and then uh, if you look at the uh, generation two uh, text reach not graphs in Luna's uh, presentation, she included her uh, Amazon product not graph inside this category where they introduce a lot of fine-grained uh, concept to describe different uh, kinds of entities. And also in their attributes, they include more uh, kind of numerical and non-numerical uh, attributes uh, inside. 
and the claim that uh, this kind of uh, uh, text rich knowledge graph may introduce uh, a lot of additional uh, information uh, to the entity based uh, relations. But still, this uh, kind of information is uh, web point zero, one, web one, uh, web one point zero uh, related because they're extracted from uh, Amazon's uh, reviews and also uh, descriptions of the uh, products. And uh, somehow they're also annotated by an uh, expert. And also they're uh, mostly entity and their product uh, attributes related information. So it's not beyond entity uh, knowledge graph. And also <clears throat> we uh, developed uh, another knowledge graph called Acer, uh, activity, state, uh, event, and their relations. And uh, we built the relations based on the discourse uh, analysis uh, used in natural language processing. And also we further conceptualize events into a more abstractive uh, knowledge format so that we can uh, perform inference over a lot of uh, events and their effects. Uh, but Acer is uh, still a uh, Web 1.0 aligned knowledge graph because uh, it's conducted in uh, using information extraction and uh, but somehow it's different from traditional knowledge graph well because it's uh, kind of an event-based knowledge. Another event-based knowledge uh, was called the Nollywood, uh, which was also uh, developed a, a couple of years ago. Um, but that's, uh, that uh, Acer has a, a bigger scope uh, than Nollywood, uh, containing much more relations and, and uh, events. <clears throat> uh, surprisingly, uh, the well-known concept net is falling into this generation because uh, the, the the nodes uh, information are loosely uh, free text. So basically <clears throat> they don't restrict the nodes uh, in concept net to be entities. And the, <clears throat> the descriptions of the relations are also free text. For example, use for, or part of, or uh, location of, and so on and so forth. So um, if you look at uh, concept net, they really have a very advanced uh, kind of a, a vision about what should be inside a knowledge graph. And uh, uh, they all uh, they not only include entities but also include events uh, and sub events. But again, uh, concept net is definitely aligned with Web 1.0 because uh, it's not user centric and it's uh, only uh, extracted from text and also uh, based on cross sourcing. And uh, in the third generation of knowledge graph, uh, we observed a lot of uh, neuralization. Uh, in uh, recent years, uh, for example, we can treat Langford model as a knowledge base, uh, but uh, in this approach, uh, we don't have structured information inside the Langford model. Uh, uh, of course, you can also uh, neuralize a existing knowledge graph and treat it as a memory network, and then you can interact with other uh, memory networks using attention mechanisms. And um, more ambitiously, uh, uh, people started to talk about neural uh, graph database uh, where uh, we can not only just uh, treat knowledge graph as knowledge base, we, uh, we can also implement a lot of uh, database uh, features uh, to support many uh, different kinds of uh, queries. <clears throat> and uh, systematically, we can support many uh, kind of queries. So basically, uh, the house part has uh, covered uh, the neural graph database queries uh, for entities, and later Jashin will uh, actually cover uh, neural graph database uh, queries for uh, or more than entity-based uh, knowledge graphs. And, but, and, and then if you look at the generation two, uh, in fact, most of the uh, developments are still one, uh, like web, web 1.0 based. So um, maybe we can move forward to a web 2.0 based method. So to start with, uh, I still want to mention one of the uh, web 1.0 based uh, knowledge graph, uh, which is called Atomic. This is a very uh, famous, uh, uh, knowledge graph or knowledge base recently developed by uh, UW and AI2. Uh, I would say this is actually the first knowledge graph uh, that is talking about users' intentions behind, behind events. So for example, if X uh, hit Y, so what is the uh, intention be, uh, uh, of X, right? And what is the effect of Y? And what is the attribute of X and Y? So basically it studied the event and their intentions and their consequences, cause effects, and then uh, evaluate their, uh, the properties and how the properties would actually contribute to those uh, cause effect uh, relations. But still, this is, uh, I would call it a 1.0 uh, based knowledge graph because it's not personalized to users. It's not uh, user-centric knowledge graph, 
but it's already very interesting because it's uh, intention based knowledge graph. <clears throat> and also the nodes inside the knowledge graph are free text, so you don't have to restrict yourself to be entities there. Uh, based on this, uh, we actually uh, uh, developed two additional intention-based knowledge graph codes, uh, Focuscope and Cosmos, uh, together with Amazon. So in Focuscope, we focused on user-generated user content, which are particularly users' cobai uh, uh, behaviors. And then we prompt large graph model to get their uh, intentions behind buying those related products. And in Cosmo, uh, we uh, evaluate the user's search by uh, behaviors, and then we uh, evaluate the intentions behind this and then uh, connect a lot of product based on that. I would call them uh, Web 2.0 based knowledge graph because they're focusing on user-centric uh, data. So let me further uh, uh, give you some discussion about the how and why we want to go beyond entity-based knowledge graph and how it's going to be aligned with uh, Web 2.0. So if you look at the uh, development of uh, Web 2.0, um, uh, mostly it's uh, user-centric and uh, use, uh, it's based on a lot of user-generated content. So for example, on Twitter, on social media, or on online, online shopping uh, uh, platforms, we observed a lot of users' behaviors like uh, purchasing and following and clicking and browsing, et cetera, et cetera. So those kind of user-generated content uh, make a key contribution to Web 2.0, uh, uh, like resulting in a lot of uh, uh, user behavior logs and many data mining algorithms were performed on those logs. So we actually want to go further beyond this because we want to understand the intentions uh, be behind this. Uh, so let me uh, give you some examples. So on Twitter, I can actually post a, a tweet uh, I can uh, I can like a, a tweet. I can uh, retweet a tweet, right? So for all those actions, there are some intentions behind it. So for example, here I uh, repost one tweet uh, from my student. So what is the, my intention? Do I want to sell my own work or do I want to promote my student, right? And the other action is I click the like to a post. But the, the, the post itself is actually describing our work, but uh, it's described by some other people, right? So what is the intention of this? Do I want to promote my own work or do I just uh, like this content? So there are always some intention differently uh, behind the same uh, action that I have on uh, those uh, Web 2.0 platforms. <clears throat> So to understand those uh, uh, actions, we actually need to go beyond entities. So uh, there are mainly two theoretical reasons we want to do this. The first one is called theory of mind. So in theory of mind, we want to study the development of knowledge about others, particularly others' intention, desire, and uh, uh, beliefs. So if we own this kind of knowledge about others, it will much it will uh, make our social communication much easier with others. Right? So um, basically, in psychology, there is a very very well known uh, intention desire uh, belief uh, model, which indicates how intention desire and belief interact with each other and how it's triggering uh, actions uh, of our social uh, lives. So basically, in its uh, uh, theory, uh, we start from belief and desire, and then we have uh, we can instantiate some uh, intentions based on them. Usually, in intention is regarded as an intermediation between the belief and desires, and based on the intention, we can take some actions where we can uh, speak some uh, uh, utterances. So, if you uh, look at the uh, context of a speech act in pragmatics, uh, they also want to understand uh, the intentions behind. Uh, the utterances. So with this, uh, uh, we would regard uh, understanding the intentions and maybe either even further desires and beliefs could be crucial to understand uh, uh, Web 2.0's applications. Another uh, theor a theoretical foundation of this is uh, we want to understand the cause and effects between events and states. And this is actually indicated in the system two processing uh, or system two thinking uh, uh, in psychology. So uh, in system two thinking, it involves, uh, involves a lot of uh, slow uh, process of reasoning, uh, linguistic reasoning and uh, sequential reasoning, logical reasoning, et cetera, et cetera. 
And in particular, uh, Yushu Bangyo in his uh, well-known talk mentioned that we need to understand the interaction between the actions and their changes in distribution. And the changes are mostly reflected in the changes of states. So basically the event and state the interaction is one of the most important thing uh, to understand users' actions. And also uh, those kind of interactions are usually non-stationary. Uh, so that means uh, for any kind of machine learning model, like if you don't have a kind of a non-stationary uh, uh, assumption, then uh, it cannot handle this kind of uh, uh, arbitrary uh, event and effect change. So a better way would be building a knowledge base to collect all those potential uh, interactions uh, in a knowledge base so that we can handle those uh, future uh, interactions. Another issue is uh, mm -hmm. uh, we want to solve is that we, why do we want to build a graph? Right? So we would argue that uh, essentially our knowledge has some structures. And, uh, and also uh, in traditional uh, knowledge representation, people organize uh, the knowledge structure in ontologies. Ontologies can contain not only entities, but also events and maybe uh, other stuff. And further, uh, Mariminsky in his very well-known uh, Kalan theory, uh, uh, he showed that uh, our mental state can also be characterized in a hierarchical uh, representation. And those hierarchical representation would be very useful for uh, our reasoning. So for example, when I uh, encounter a new event or a new problem, I don't really want to retrieve the exact the same instance in my mind. I actually want to uh, build some high level representation of uh, my own, my uh, past experiences and then apply the method instead of the exact um, uh, similar events to the new uh, events. Inference. So basically, uh, in Kalan theory, uh, Mara Minsky argued that we should map uh, a particular mental state into a band uh, with a, a high limit and a low limit, so that we can conceptualize the mental state in the right uh, uh, right level of uh, abstraction. So besides the right level of uh, abstraction, we also need the right uh, perspective of abstraction. So for example, Coca-Cola can be conceptualized to be sugary beverage or ice drink, uh, but drinking Coca-Cola can also be uh, conceptualized in many different uh, high level uh, uh, abstractive uh, events. For example, you can even uh, conceptualize it to be event, but it's nothing helpful for uh, any kind of sub, in, uh, sub uh, problem inferences. And also, uh, if you think about different consequences of drinking Coca-Cola, uh, drinking Coca-Cola should be conceptualized into different uh, uh, abstractions. For example, people can get refreshed or people can gain weight, right? So for different perspectives, you really want to conceptualize Coca-Cola in different concepts. Another reason is more practical reason. Uh, we want to represent our knowledge in a graph so that we can leverage a lot of uh, graphical uh, algorithms uh, in the past developed to handle those high complexity problems. And also uh, sometimes we need some global uh, referred knowledge to perform a uh, summarization for our knowledge. Uh, particularly uh, a, a recent paper developed by uh, Microsoft uh, CEO strategic office, they show that they really uh, can leverage a graph uh, to get some global statistics and global uh, information uh, so that we can help the recent uh, developed the RAG system uh, retrieval augmented generation. And also uh, we need some graph uh, reasoning algorithms to solve some complicated uh, reasoning problems. Uh, for example, in common sense reasoning, we uh, usually want to uh, collect a lot of common sense uh, uh, assertions, and then we can build a, a kind of a set uh, uh, problem uh, to infer new knowledge. So solving that problem is NP-complete. So if you uh, use some existing machine learning model, that may not be uh, enough. And also sometimes we want to do counting, and counting is also a typical uh, NP-complete problem. So it's better to represent or fix those knowledge in a graph uh, rather than just to store them in uh, a large length model. And also uh, in practice, we also want to uh, consider the trade-off between uh, the efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, it's also better to index our fixed knowledge into a uh, database or uh, 
knowledge base so that we can actually retrieve them on the fly uh, to support many uh, real world applications. So uh, given those uh, thinkings, uh, we uh, proposed a framework uh, to uh, obtain this kind of user-centric intention-based knowledge graphs, where we call it a generative uh, knowledge graph construction framework. So basically we start from users' behaviors, uh, like uh, users call buy of product, users search by uh, products, and so on and so forth. And then we prompt a large link model to understand their intentions behind. And uh, we further use some Python mining approaches to collect those high frequency intentions and low frequency intentions and remove of, uh, remove some of the uh, noise. And also we perform uh, abstraction or conceptualization to collect more high level intentions, maybe even further uh, used to describe the desires uh, or motivations. And then uh, we uh, also leverage some human annotation uh, based on Amazon Turk and also internally in, at Amazon, uh, we uh, leverage their annotation team to annotate the intentions behind. And based on that, we construct a knowledge graph and we use the knowledge graph to provide more human feedback uh, to uh, the generative model so that we can train a better uh, generative model or a lecture model that is particularly uh, working on uh, intentions. And we call this uh, AI generated KG framework. So uh, to give you some uh, illustration, uh, this is a typical subgraph of a uh, folk scope, which is based on the COBI uh, behaviors. So we basically start from some COBI uh, behaviors, user actions like buying an iPhone and also an iWatch. And then um, we guess what are the potential intentions behind it. So as you can see, there are many intentions aligned with the relations uh, that is shown in the concept net. So for example, in concept net, we have a useful relation, we have part of relation, we have a sort of relation, and we have a desire of relation and so on and so forth. And we, 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 in our prompt, we uh, better, we well aligned with them. And uh, we show that this kind of a, a concept net relations are somehow very useful uh, to uh, understand the user's intentions related to the products. And uh, in addition to this, uh, we also have some open relations that allows a large link model to uh, generally prompt any kind of in intention behind those uh, cobi and uh, search by behaviors. <clears throat> and further, we conceptualize them to be very high level intentions, like a fan of Apple products can be conceptualized to be fan of electricities. Uh, and uh, protect one's computer can be conceptualized to protect one's device. And with these kind of uh, uh, high level intentions, we can actually generalize to a lot of uh, uh, new products. So uh, interestingly, we have uh, internally, at Amazon, we have internally tested our uh, knowledge graph uh, on the fly. And uh, we've shown that uh, it's really useful to increase uh, the, the revenue, basically. So our deployment uh, is, uh, Related to the search query navigation part, not the query recommendation, uh, we uh, actually uh, given a user search query, we understand its intention, and based on our understanding, we uh, shown some uh, uh, index of the concept or intentions that we discovered, and based on those, a user can actually click those uh, intentions related concept, and then they can further uh, explore more related uh, product. It's translated uh, to hundreds of millions of uh, uh, revenue gain uh, in the past year. So that's basically uh, what we have done for Web 2.0 Aligned Knowledge Graph. And uh, we would like to also outlook for uh, uh, Web 3.0's uh, Knowledge Graphs. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer uh, to this, but uh, um, maybe we can look into the properties of Web 3.0. So obviously there are many uh, features, like you can develop some blockchains, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But uh, uh, to us, uh, we would like to look into the content related features. So essentially uh, when we are moving towards uh, Web 3.0, uh, we found that user can actually share their content and knowledge in, uh, in their uh, own website. And then um, user can actually monetize uh, those data and knowledge based on their sharing. And if others vote or uh, or click or whatever, uh, uh, take actions on the knowledge and content, user can earn some tokens on the blockchain, for example. 
So this kind of a monetization may, may motivate a lot of users to share their knowledge and the content. <clears throat> but on the other hand, this sharing is trustless and this sharing is actually permissionless. So anyone can access whatever uh, data you actually shared uh, on the chain. So in this sense, uh, privacy and the security would be a very significant uh, concern uh, to the application. Uh, particularly if you want to share some knowledge, but the knowledge was based on some experiences that you actually had in the past, and you really don't want to share your own experience. But if you share the knowledge that uh, can be accessed by other people, maybe uh, an attacker can actually guess what's uh, behind uh, the knowledge you have, you have shared. So to remedy this, uh, we uh, initiated this, this uh, very ambitious uh, project called Privacy Preserved Neural Graph Database. Although it's not uh, really uh, kind of uh, achieving to the to the goal, somehow uh, we studied uh, the current coders of the Neural Graph Database, and we found that uh, if we want to protect some of the entities or some of the key information. Uh, an attacker can actually have multiple ways to query the knowledge graph, and then they can actually vote or guess uh, what's inside the knowledge graph. So uh, uh, given these kind of uh, potential private uh, information leakage, we want to protect what we want to, uh, we, we, we want to preserve, right? So uh, to solve this question, <clears throat> uh, we studied the construction of the qu complex queries in the neural graph databases, and we found that indeed multiple queries can actually reach uh, to the entities that we really want to preserve. We don't really want to remove those entities in our neural graph database because they will help us to improve the performance of other uh, queries and reasoning tasks. So a uh, solution to this would be then we build a adversarial uh, learning uh, objective to protect those potential uh, private uh, uh, information leakage and then uh, we train we train those uh, objectives together with the original uh, neural graph uh, query encoder uh, objectives. And then uh, putting everything together, uh, our hope is that uh, we can preserve the private information. And then uh, uh, we also can achieve certain level of uh, query accuracy on uh, traditional uh, tasks. So putting everything together uh, in the first part of, uh, of part four, I have discussed the different categorizations of the new development of knowledge graphs. Uh, particularly, I emphasized on the alignment with Web 1, 2, 3, uh, because uh, this is uh, really uh, important to us to understand what's happening uh, on the web and what we should apply our knowledge graph on the web. And uh, later, um, uh, Jiaxin will uh, continue this topic to talk about how we're going to perform reasoning over different semantic units, including events and intentions. So let's see my question to uh, thank you. Um. Hello everyone, welcome to a tutorial on the new frontiers of knowledge web reasoning, recent events and future trends. In this part, I will be talking, uh, I will be discussing the neural graph, uh, neural reasoning beyond entities and relations part two. Well, this is our uh, general roadmap. So in previous section, we'll, we'll look into the cutting edge developments of KGs across three different dimensions. And we also introduced two of the dimensions which is the which is the development of, development of web and ge, and the generations of KG. Now in this section, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to dive into the uh, we're going to uh, we're going to dive into three specific uh, KG reasoning works that corresponding to the third dimensions, and this works deal with the various semantic units of the KG. And the first work we'll look into is the uh, knowledge graph uh, reasoning over entities and numerical values. And this one talks about reasoning at the entity, property, and attributes level. And the second work is the complex query answering on eventuality knowledge graphs with implicit logical constraints. 
Here we deal with the reasoning at the, at the events processes level. And finally, the third work is the complex an uh, answering over logical queries on common sense cages. And, and, and this one, and this one, uh, and, th and this one deal with uh, deal with the reason the common sense reasoning over the intentions, beliefs, and desires. So let's let's go into the details. In the first work, knowledge graph reasoning over entities and numerical values, we're focusing on answer uh, complex queries involving numerical values. For example, finding the Turing Award winners that are that is born before 1927, or finding the states in U.S. that have higher latitudes than Beijing, and find the states in U.S. that have twice small, uh, find the states in U.S. that have twice smaller populations uh, than California. To, ad uh, to address the limitations of previous uh, previous uh, query encoding methods, we proposed the number reasoning network method. Well, we'll take this query finding the cities that have higher latitudes than Japanese cities as an example. Suppose we, we want to know, suppose we want to answer this logical query and which asks you to find the cities with higher latitudes than Japan's, J Japanese cities. The query is first parsed into a computational graph. And then we use the proposed NRN methods to, 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 uh, to separately encoding, to encoding the two in, in different tool encoding phases, uh, separately for the entities and numerical values. Well, well, well go, go through this example step by step. First, uh, first uh, we, 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 we find the entity embeddings of the anchor uh, entity of Japan. And then a relational projection is used to compute the you know, is compute the representations of city in, in Japan as a part of encoding uh, part of entity encoding phase. And then the, the numerical value, uh, and then the numerical distribution indicating the latitude values of cities in Japan are computed using an attribute projection. And then the NRM methods then compute the distributions of latitude values that are greater than the previous result using a numerical projection of greater than. And then with the resulting distribution is then used to, uh, it, it, it's then, uh, it's then uh, used in a re reverse attribute projection to find the cities with latitude values um, that satisfy the query's conditions. Uh, and this query and the query encoding process switch back to the, in, uh, the entity phrase. To, to handle the logical operations for entities such as uh, such as uh, relational projection and uh, and uh, uh, unions and intersections, we we use established query encoding methods as backbones in as backbones to solve the entities uh, entities uh, entities uh, query encoding. And specifically, we use the three different uh, encoding structures: GQE, Q2B, and particles. And in the implementation part. And for other projection operators, we use the gated transition to parameterize. And this gated transition involves linear projections, an MVP layer, and the gate selection. To compute the querying, uh, to, to compute the NRN query embeddings, we need to use the, num the numerical embeddings to, 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 to project the attribute values from 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 the real numbers to to RD to obtain the numerical embeddings, uh, we use two deterministic uh, numerical encodings, which is the dice and the sinusoidals to compute such value. Dice is a deterministic independent of corpus word embedding for numbers, and the sinusoidal encoding um, was first proposed for encoding the token positions in transformer model. But we find it also be very effective in directly encoding um, numerical values as well. And this function works well in this setting and, it, and the, its input values do not necessarily need to be integers. During the learning process, we use the joint optimizes of these two losses. The first loss is, the, is over the numerical distribution where we use the first term to, to describe the likelihood of Value v being sampled from the distribution theta, and the second pro second term is the likelihood of distribution parameters theta a is of type t. 
And meanwhile, the second loss is to minimize the distribution differences of the predicted entities and the uh, and the answers. Mm, by by jointly optimize these two losses, we can effectively train an RN model to handle complex queries um, in, involving both the entities and numerical values. Well, in the second work, we are going to introduce the complex query answering over eventuality graphs with implicit logical constraints. And this works uh, discuss how to conduct logical reasoning over the graph describing events and processes. In this work, we uh, in this work of eventuality reasoning, we use Acer as our knowledge graph data set. Acer is constructed is constructed for describing the relations between activities, events, and states, and it is built by uh, uh, different di different semantic parsers following the principle of comparing semantic meanings by fixing grammar, and also by the by the need of language inferences based on the based on partial information. Um, complex correlating on event graph is very different from that uh, uh, from the entity relation graph because uh, whether and when each event happens is 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 very important in the reasoning process. Um, for example, this is an entity. This is an entity query which asks for finding a substance that interacts with the proteins associated with Alzheimer and medical disease. This is an entity level. But for event, but for event level. Uh, suppose we know that some uh, we know food is bad. It's happened before someone adds soy sauce in a cooking process, and if we ask question, what is the reason of food being bad? Then adding soy sauce cannot be the reason. This is because something happens, something happens later cannot be the reason of something happened before. Yeah, and for another example, suppose we know instead of buying umbrella, person X go home. Then we ask a question. Uh, what happened before person X go home, then buying an umbrella should not be the answer because it did not happen. How can we describe such constraints over occurrences of events and temporal order of events? We can use logical uh, expressions derived from discourse relations. For example, here, we use the eta to, 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 to denote whether an event happens or not and use tau to denote the temporal order of events. Then we can derive the following expressions. Uh, person X, did not eat anything, and person X was full. Both happens, and the the happen of uh, person X was full causes person X did not eat anything. And meanwhile, we know that person X did not eat anything happened after person X was full. And here is an example of temporal relations, which means uh, person X uh, food is bad, and person X as a source both happens. And the food is bad before a person acts at soy sauce. And here's an examples of the occurrences constraints, which means person acts go home happens, and person acts uh person acts uh, uh, buying on bread does not happen. Here is a table of the logical lo logical constraints behind the discourse relations, and both the temporal constraints and occurrence constraints can be derived in by the discourse relations. For example, uh, for example, uh, in discourse relations, we have uh, event A happens before B, event A as a result B, and if A then B, A or B, A and B, and A except B. So we can have the we can derive such implicit logical constraints from the from the discourse relations. And how can we can answer such query in the in the in the knowledge graph uh, to, uh, to to solve the logical que uh, questions? Um, to address the logic constraints within the process of answering uh, compiled logic queries, we propose querying coding method with constraint memory. For the for the each steps for the each step steps of encoding the process uh, encoding a complex query, we first compute uh, compute the relevance of the query embedding to the head of the memory keys to the to the head of the memory keys and. And then, uh, uh, and then in the second step, we compute the aggregated memory values across M memory cells with importance weighted by the re relevance score. Uh, and finally, we can uh, we can add back the constraints values from the constraint memory with the memory values uh, with the help of a MLP layer. Well, 
Then we discussed the third work uh, on the logical reasoning over common sense cages. And this one tackles common sense reasoning over belief, intention, desire with an emphasis on the common sense cages. Um, specifically, we, we target on, uh, targets on intention-based common sense uh, complex query answering. Well, reasoning um, reasoning on the real world text and narratives requires complex reasoning over multiple events and inferring implicit context. And for example, we have uh, some kind of uh, abduction reasoning. Uh, here's an example. Um, it, it was a hot and sunny day, but John feels much better. And this is, uh, we, we try to find the, uh, the most possible explanation to this. And we can, we can from this two, uh, two atomic expressions, we can find it was a hot and sunny day. We can find it, it causes someone to drink a glass of uh, ice water. And meanwhile, uh, drinking uh, a glass of ice water can have the effects of a person uh, of a joint you know, feel, feels much better. And also we are interested in finding a common cause. For example, smoking is a common cause of lung cancer and getting coronary artery disease. And meanwhile, we're uh, moving, moving toward a new place, uh, causes making new friends and further causes uh, throwing a party. And this could be a multiple, uh, multi, multi hop event. To systematically evaluate different NLP methods or or, or or NLP models to complex such complex common sense reasoning, we propose a method of uh, of generating such uh, common common complex common sense questions from common sense cages. Um, for for example, well, uh, we in, in the first step we sample some uh, conjunctive logical queries uh, from the common sense KG, and then we use LLMs to verbalize those queries and answers um, to uh, to uh, uh, to ask natural language, uh, natural language question answering pairs. For example, we in the in the in the in the generation process, LM would uh, add some uh, 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 well, some add some context. For example, person has uh, living a uh, boring life, and then we we use rule based discourse uh, to to add some some discourse relations. And after, for example, after getting tired of it, person X goes to skydiving. And then we can generate, uh, verbalize such uh, complex query answering like um, what is both the intention of person X going skydiving and what X want is to, you know, wants to do after person X getting tired of it. And the answer is the finding something new to do. Similar to the CQA problems, we sampled five types of training queries and hold, hold out two types of queries for out of this distribution evaluation. And here are some examples, for example, uh, common attributes. Um, X pulled out white phone and, what, and X swing white legs. And what is common attribute of X is a person, uh, the X is a childish, uh, it's childish. And some negated common common course, for example, uh, uh, X begin to hurt and X won't take medication and access pain is hidden, is hindered by taking medication. And there are also some uh, second order effects. For example, X starts a new life because X want to make some new friends and further, further effect is X want to, uh, to be socialized. And there are also some, uh, com here are also some complex, uh, 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 here are also some com uh, complex uh, conjunctive queries in the common sense. And after using the LM to verbalize such logical queries uh, on common sense KG, and we used the generated uh, question answering you know, question answer pairs to further construct a multiple QA benchmark. And we have we now have the correct answer. And for the negative samples, we you we sampled two randomly out of the common sense KBs, and two are randomly sampled across uh, one hop answers, which are considered uh, hard negative answers. Meanwhile, we provide no answers or correct options to this data set. In general, we hire 53 annotators to annotate and their fleece kappa is around 0.44 and inter, inter annotator agreements is around 78. And all the disagreements are, are fixed by the experts. And here are some performance on, the, on this complex common sense recent data set. 
then we find out that GPT model is only uh is only can achieve thirty seven percent to fifty seven percent in this data set, and for the open LRMs, it can achieve thirty three percent to sixty percent of this uh this uh this question, and with with the fine tune the pre trained uh, language models, uh, they can achieve sixty two percent to sixty three percent in in this benchmark. So we can we can find that the LRM is still for short uh, in this task. Here we have uh, covered three types of uh, uh, semantic units in this horizontal axis with three different words in the KG reasoning. And we have reviewed the frontiers of recent developments of the graphs with three different semantic units, entities, attributes, event processes, and intention, belief, desire. And more uh, advances on knowledge KG combined with the LMs will be introduced by in part five by Li Hui Liu. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, hello. Okay, um, um, thanks, Joshin, for the introduction. And uh, so, um, in the next part, I will introduce uh, combining. Uh, large language models with uh, knowledge graph reasoning. So um, what is the language model? Uh, so we can think of language model is a probability distribution over strings of text. And uh, so the language model functions like a, a black box and uh, it will assign the probability number to different uh, strings. And usually if the number is high, then it means that we will have a high probability to encounter this string in our daily life. So if the probability is no, then it means that the string is not very good. And uh, here I give uh, three examples. So for example, for the first string, like Sunny feed my cat with meat. And for this string, the language model uh, assign a very high probability to it. Well, this is because uh, so this string is uh, grammar, grammatically correct, and uh, so it makes sense. Well, for the third string, like a uh, uh, feed cat meet uh, my my ways. So for this string, the language model assign a very uh, low probability to it. This is because it contains some uh, grammar mistakes. And now with the advent of large language models, so it uh, shows good performance in many different uh, natural, language uh, natural language processing tasks. And generally, so the large language model is a large and general purpose language model, which can be pre-trained and then fine-tuned for specific purpose. Well, some examples include the ChatGPT, the GPT-4, NAMA and also uh, NAMA 3. And uh, so in recent years, the size of the large language model uh, increased a lot. So uh, it uh, increases from 0 0.1 billion to more than uh, 500 billion in a short period of time. And uh, so this increase doesn't just mean the increase of the number. It also means the performance of the language model. So usually when the size becomes large, then the model will have a better performance in many different uh, natural language processing uh, downstream tasks. And here we give uh, some language models uh, which are released in recent years. 
And in 2023, uh, two language models, the LAMA2 and uh, GPT-4, were the uh, milestones in the development of large language models. And the LAMA2 is an open source language model, so which performs uh, very well in many tasks. And it has the similar performance as ChatGPT. So while uh, GPT-4 sets new records for the size of the model and also uh, the performance on different tasks. So this timeline uh, shows the progression and the improvement of large language models. And just as we introduced before, so the knowledge graph is a graph, a graph structure data. So it contains the uh, real world facts and uh, the accurate structural knowledge. So it's interpretable. But the, one, but the problem for knowledge graph is that it's uh, incomplete and uh, uh, noisy. So it uh, lacks language uh, understanding. Well, for the language models, it uh, contains the general knowledge and uh, good at uh, language understanding. But the problem is uh, they suffer from hallucination problem and they uh, lack interpretation and uh, uh, lack new knowledge. So recently, many uh, researchers try to combine the uh, knowledge graphs with uh, large language models so that we can design a model not only accurate, efficient, but also interpretable. And uh, so when combining uh, knowledge graphs with large language models, so generally we have three different uh, ways. Well, uh, for the first uh, uh, category, it's like uh, we can use uh, knowledge graphs to enhance large language models. And uh, here, the knowledge graphs will be treated as the external knowledge or the data for the language model. Well, in the second, for the second category here, uh, we can use language models to uh, enhance the knowledge graph reasoning process. And here, the uh, language model will be treated as a component uh, during the uh, knowledge graph reasoning process. Well, in the third part, so we can uh, combine large language models with knowledge graph reasoning together uh, in a mutually beneficial way so that uh, they can uh, help each other. So now let's first say the, uh, the first uh, category, how to uh, use knowledge graphs to uh, enhance large language models. And uh, uh, so given a common sense question, such as uh, if, if it's not for hell, a the brush is an example of what, along with the uh, several candidate answers of this question. So in this work, the QA uh, GNN, they want to uh, correctly, uh, uh, correctly find the answer among uh, all, these, uh, all these candidate answers. So uh, naturally, in order to correctly find the answer for the question, uh, the system needs to access a lot of knowledge and uh, also reason about it. And there are two different, uh, so all the knowledge can stored in two uh, different uh, ways. So for example, uh, we can store the knowledge uh, in the language model. So all the knowledge are stored as the parameters in the model. Well, we can also store all the knowledge as a knowledge graph. And uh, so each node in the knowledge graph is used to represent the real world entities and the edges is used to denote their relationships with each other. But uh, as we mentioned before, so despite the language model is good at uh, uh, language understanding and uh, problem solving, but uh, they do not work well for interpretable or logical reasoning and uh, they lack interpretation. Well, for knowledge graphs, despite they contain the accurate uh, knowledge. Usually knowledge graphs are incomplete and uh, noisy. So uh, how to combine these two parts together uh, is challenging and we need to uh, solve two problems. So the first problem is how to identify the uh, relevant information in the knowledge graph. And the second problem is how to uh, jointly reason over the text and also the knowledge graph. 
Well, in this work, uh, they propose a method called uh, QAGNN, so which is a hybrid method. And uh, uh, the, uh, so the overview of this uh, method is shown in the bottom of these slides. So uh, most specifically in this uh, work, given a uh, QA context, they will first use the language model to uh, learn embedding for the fourth chain. And then they will retrieve a subgraph from the knowledge graph and uh, try to use the uh, QA context information and also the uh, knowledge graph information to find the answers. And so in the first step, given a QA context, the language model is used uh, to learn the uh, question embedding. And at the same time, so uh, they will uh, use the embedding to uh, retrieve a uh, subgraph. And in order to measure the importance of each node in the subgraph, they uh, propose a language model based uh, on language conditioned knowledge graph loader relevance scoring module. So this part will assign a different uh, score to different uh, nodes in the subgraph. And later, uh, in order to uh, letter the uh, language model can be uh, interacted with the knowledge graph, they connect uh, the uh, QA context embedding with the knowledge graph, and then they use a uh, uh, graph neural network methods to update uh, the subgraph embedding. And after that, the uh, graph embedding and also the QA context embedding uh, will be used together to uh, find the answers. So they uh, they tested the method on two uh, different uh, data sets, so which are the uh, common sense QA and also the open book QA. So as we can see, the proposed method uh, can achieve the state of the art performance compared with uh, the previous uh, language model uh, combined the large graph methods, and also by compare with the language model such as uh, Robata, the proposed uh, the performance gain is uh, quite uh, significant. Well, despite uh, using knowledge graph to uh, fine tune the, uh, the language model is a good idea, but the problem is that uh, so now the language model are usually very large. So when the size of the model becomes a large, then uh, retraining or fine tuning the model uh, becomes very time consuming and uh, it uh, costs a lot of resource. So in order to solve this problem, uh, recently some researchers, they uh, try to use an alternative method. So their idea is that uh, given a query, then they will try to uh, find some uh, knowledge from the external data sources. And then they want to uh, use this uh, external knowledge uh, to treat it as the input of the language models and uh, help the language model to uh, generate uh, the correct answers. And this type of method is also uh, called uh, retrieval augmented generation, uh, which is short for uh, RAG. And uh, so, um, so for more information related to the uh, RAG-based method uh, can be found in some other tutorials. And here, uh, we only give a very brief introduction about uh, this method. And let's see a very simple example about the uh, retrieval augmented generation based uh, method. So in this work, uh, KG GPT, uh, they, uh, so uh, their goal is to utilize language models and also knowledge graphs to answer a more complex natural language questions. And here, given a sentence or a question, so their idea is to first uh, uh, participate the original sentence or the question into several uh, sub-sentences. And for each sub-sentence, uh, it will be much easier to solve compared with the original sentence. And uh, so most specifically, after they partition uh, the original sentence in two multiple sub-sentences. Then for each sub-sentence, they will uh, use a graph retrieval, uh, retrieval to find a subgraph inside the large graph. And then this subgraph, along with the uh, original sub-sentences, will be treated as 
the input of the uh, large language models to generate the output. And finally, uh, all the results or all the top K uh, results of each sub sentences will be uh, aggregated together to generate the final answers. And here are, uh, here are some experimental results. So as we can see, uh, the proposed method, so uh, they compare the proposed method KGGBT with uh, ChatGBT and also some uh, traditional embedding-based question answering uh, methods like uh, uh, embed KGQA, uh, GraphNet, and uh, uh, key value memory uh, networks. So as we can see, compared with ChatGBT, the improvement is quite uh, significant. So on average, the accuracy improvement is uh, more than 40%. Well, compared with traditional embedding-based methods like embed KGQA, so they can achieve very similar performance uh, when the background knowledge graph is uh, complete. And uh, so, uh, so previous methods, they usually uh, enhance a language model with a retrieval by updating the language model's uh, parameters. And just as we mentioned before, so when the language model becomes large, then this uh, fine tune based method is a lot of feasible. Uh, so some researchers, they try to uh, fine tune or train a tunable a retriever to further improve the uh, model's performance. And in this paper, a replug, so that they treat the language model as a, a black box. And they assume that the language model can only be accessed through the uh, server, through the API. And in order to uh, further like, improve the performance and get good results, they uh, so they try to use a frozen or tunable retriever to find uh, some uh, new knowledge according to the external uh, knowledge database. And in this paper, they propose two uh, different methods. So, well, the first method is called a uh, replug. So their idea is that uh, given a question like uh, uh, Jobs, Jobs is the CEO of Word. And then they will first uh, use a retriever to retrieve multiple uh, documents. And uh, they treat these uh, documents as, uh, as uh, some new knowledge. And then for each uh, document, they will uh, concatenate that document with the original question, like a, a Jobs is the CEO of, of what, and then they pass this through a language model so that uh, here we can get uh, many different results. For example, if we have like a, a three different documents, then we can get uh, uh, three different results. And after that, an ensemble model is used to uh, aggregate all the uh, results and so to generate the final uh, final results. And besides that, this paper also proposed an improved version, uh, which is called uh, Replug LSR. So their idea is to uh, fine tune the retriever so that the retriever will have a uh, uh, better performance. Well, their idea is uh, first they will use the retriever to uh, find the top K documents. And at the same time, uh, they will use the retriever to uh, calculate the likelihood that uh, the retrieved documents will contain the correct answers. And after that, they will use the language model to com uh, compute the uh, likelihood that uh, the retrieved documents uh, contains the answers. And then they will calculate the KL divergence between uh, these two distributions and use the KL divergence uh, to update the retriever. So uh, now we have introduced uh, several different uh, methods, so which based on the uh, generative, uh, the retrieval uh, generate, uh, the drug based method. But uh, one so problem for these types of method is that uh, they all require that uh, the external uh, data source contains the accurate uh, results. And moreover, uh, they fail to answer some global questions, so such as, uh, what are the main themes in the data set? So these global questions usually uh, requires us to 
um, to, to like uh, summarize the uh, external data uh, source in order to answer the question. So in order to solve this uh, problem in this paper graph rack, so their idea is that uh, they want to first uh, build a knowledge graph according to the external uh, data. And then, so for all the loads inside of the uh, knowledge graphs, they will divide them into different communities and generate a, a summation for each community. And then given, um, so given a global question, they will uh, try to generate the answers according to the community summarizations. So most specifically for the traditional uh, rag based uh, method, so they are given a private uh, uh, data set, the traditional rag based method. So we are first divide the uh, private data set into different uh, chunks. And then for each chunk, they will use a, a vector uh, to represent that the text chunk. And all the vectors are stored in a vector database. And then give a question. So they will first retrieve uh, the k uh, the k text chunks, which has the uh, highest similarity with the question. And then so use these uh, k text chunks to generate uh, the results. Well, for the uh, graph rack, the idea is that uh, given the text uh, information, they will use uh, language models such as GPT-4 to detect all the entities and the relations uh, uh, inside this text data. And then they build a knowledge graph according to this text data. So after we have this knowledge graph, then further some uh, machine graph, machine learning based method will be used uh, to uh, divide all the nodes into, uh, into different communities at uh, different levels. And then, so we can generate the summation for each uh, community at uh, different levels. So finally, give the global question. Then we can uh, ask uh, the language model to uh, generate the results according to the summation of uh, different uh, communities. So now we have introduced uh, the first category, how to uh, use knowledge graphs to uh, enhance large language models. Now let's see the second uh, category, how to use large language models to uh, enhance the knowledge graph reasoning process. Um, so for this paper, uh, thinking on graph, uh, so for the traditional rag based methods, uh, usually uh, we will retrieve some information from the knowledge graph. And then this retrieved information will be a user to augment the prompt and feed it into the language models. But one problem for these uh, types of method is that uh, uh, in the whole reasoning process, the language models uh, do not participate in the graph reasoning process directly. So um, uh, thus, um, they actually uh, couldn't get uh, the good performance sometimes, especially when the knowledge graph is incomplete. So because um, when the external data source doesn't contain the accurate answers, then uh, the language model couldn't uh, find the answers uh, directly. So in order to solve this problem in this paper, uh, their goal is to uh, treat the uh, large language models as an agent to uh, travel through the knowledge graph and perform reasoning based on uh, some paths on the knowledge graph to find the results. So now let's say an example here. Uh, given the question, uh, what's the majority party law in the country where uh, Canberra is located? So for the traditional uh, language model based method, if we directly ask the language models, uh, then the uh, answers generated by the model has a high probability to be uh, incorrect. Well, on the other hand, uh, for the traditional language model with a knowledge graph based method, so they will first uh, transform the input natural language question to a Sparkle query. And then they try to uh, run the Sparkle query on the knowledge graph to find the correct answer. But here, because the knowledge graph is uh, incomplete, 
So for example, the edge between the entity Australia and the Labour Party is missing. Thus, directly query the knowledge graph couldn't find the results. So in this works, uh, they try to treat large language models as an agent. Uh, for example, um, starting from the entity uh, Cambrana, then the language model will decide um, will decide uh, like uh, which node is might be the correct answer. Uh, that uh, by, by calculator the score for all the labels of entity Cambrana. And here in this example, the language model think that Australia might be the correct uh, potential answers. And uh, so Australia will get the highest score. And after this step, the agent will travel to uh, Australia. And then the language model will uh, again calculate the uh, probability for all the labels of the entity Australia and choose the one with the highest uh, score. So this time, the uh, knowledge model think uh, uh, Antoni and uh, Ambanis has the highest uh, probability. So the agent will travel to uh, entity Antoni and Banis. And this process will repeat uh, multiple times until uh, the language model think uh, the correct answer uh, is found. So now we have introduced uh, uh, how to use uh, large language models to uh, enhance the knowledge graph reasoning process. Uh, in the last part, I will introduce how to um, like uh, letter the language models and also the knowledge graph in, uh, embedding knowledge graph reasoning methods to uh, mutually uh, enhance each other. So we know that uh, a knowledge graph embedding is uh, one of the uh, fundamental methods for a uh, knowledge graph reasoning. Well, for traditional uh, knowledge graph embedding based on methods like uh, transe, uh, rotate, or complex. So they simply consider the uh, graph structure information of, uh, of the knowledge graph. Well, in many real world uh, knowledge graphs, uh, usually the entities inside the knowledge graph has many, uh, like, uh, has rich text information. So, for example, we can find the uh, uh, some uh, shorter paragraphs or text to uh, describe the meaning of the laws uh, inside of the knowledge graph. So if we can use this uh, text information, then probably we can uh, learn a better embedding for all the entities in the knowledge graph. Well, on the other hand, existing uh, language models such as uh, BERT or Robata, so they are good at uh, language understanding. And how to combine these uh, two parts together is uh, an interesting problem. So in this paper, uh, Kepler, so their idea is that uh, they treated the language model as an encoder. And then, so for each node uh, in the knowledge graph, they will use capital to learn the load embedding by taking uh, the text, uh, uh, text description of the uh, node and then uh, some traditional knowledge graph embedding methods like uh, transe or rotate is used uh, to uh, learn the embedding. Well, at the same time, the uh, mask of the language modeling um, objects will be also used here to uh, further fine tune the uh, encoder. And uh, so in the experiment, the author uh, like compared the proposed method for both the, the traditional a uh, knowledge graph embedding methods like uh, a and also a uh, language model methods like a uh, robot. So as we can see, the proposed method uh, can achieve the state of the art performance on uh, many uh, natural language processing tasks. Well, for the knowledge graph embedding methods, uh, the proposed method can also achieve a similar performance as the state of the art um, model. Uh, one problem for the Previous Kepler method is that uh, so they simply use uh, like embedding methods like uh, transe or rotate. So they couldn't, uh, that type of method couldn't uh, fully capture the structure information of the knowledge graph. So, in order to further solve this problem uh, in this work, uh, Jacket, so they use, uh, they use a graph neural networks to uh, capture the uh, structure information of the knowledge graph. And more specifically here, like a given a knowledge graph, 
So they will first use the language model to uh, learn the initialize embedding for all the entities inside of the knowledge graph. And then they will use a attention-based graph neural network to update the uh, graph embeddings. And this updated embedding will be used in uh, different uh, downstream tasks, such as a relation prediction and also uh, entity category prediction and so on. Well, moreover, after we get the uh, updated uh, node embedding, so these embeddings will be treated as the input of the second uh, language model. Well, the output of the language model uh, will be used, will be tested on some other uh, tasks, such as uh, mask the entity prediction and uh, mask the token prediction and so on. So by combining these uh, two different objects together, so they will train a model that uh, let the uh, knowledge graph embedding and also the language model to uh, help each other. And here are some uh, experimental results. And they compile the proposed jacket with uh, different methods, different language models, uh, such as uh, Robota and also the previous uh, Kepler. And uh, the proposed jacket can achieve the state-of-the-art performance. And moreover, it uh, uh, has a better performance on various uh, natural language processing tasks. So now we have uh, covered the uh, uh, five different uh, topics related to uh, knowledge graph embedding. So in the uh, last part, so I will uh, briefly introduce the open challenges and also the future directions for a knowledge graph embedding. Well, for the future direction, so one possible di future direction uh, we think uh, might be promising is the uh, multimodal knowledge graph reasoning. So um, we think that a multimodal knowledge graph is an imagine a research uh, area that combines the structured uh, knowledge graph with some unstructured data, such as uh, image, video, audio, and uh, other forms of uh, sensory information. Well, existing knowledge graph reasoning methods are mainly focused on um, like uh, entity-based uh, knowledge graphs where equal uh, rich uh, information in other uh, types of uh, data, such as image, uh, audio, or videos. So uh, in the future, we think that uh, uh, if we can design a good model on the a multimodal knowledge graph, then it might help us to solve uh, different uh, types of different uh, downstream tasks. So for example, how to check whether two images are the same or how to measure the similarities between uh, two uh, audios. Well, the second future direction is the uh, retrieval augmented multimodal language models. Um, so just as we introduced before, uh, retrieval augmented generation is an AI a framework for improving the quality of uh, large language model generated response uh, by grounding the model on external data sources. While well, existing a uh, right based method, a uh, meaning focus on uh, text data or the uh, graph data, but for some other data like uh, the video data, audio data, or even the a special temporal data uh, are not considered uh, currently. So how to design a rank model which can uh, utilize these uh, different uh, types of data um, is a promising uh, direction, future direction. Well, the third uh, future direction is a knowledge graph foundation models uh, for broader applications. So we know that uh, since uh, large language models uh, came, uh, it has better performance on many uh, different uh, tasks. Then for the uh, graph data domain, so how can we train a uh, graph foundation model or how do we train a knowledge graph foundation model is a very interesting topic. And we know that a uh, knowledge graph reasoning uh, plays a pivotal role in many different, uh, uh, in many high impact uh, applications, such as the recommender system, the drug discovery, the factor checking, and so on. So how to how can we get a graph, a knowledge graph foundation model, and uh, apply it to 
uh, different uh, applications uh, is uh, promising a future direction. And uh, so to summarize uh, in this uh, tutorial, we uh, mainly cover the following uh, four, uh, four topics or four recent uh, advances. So the first one is, uh, is a neural reasoning for a natural language question, uh, which we talk about uh, a bunch of uh, methods related to uh, reasoning for natural language questions. While the second topic is a neural reasoning for uh, logical queries. And where we talk about many uh, different uh, uh, logical query methods. And the uh, third category is the uh, neural reasoning beyond entities and uh, relations. And finally, we uh, talk about uh, knowledge graph reasoning uh, and also uh, large language models. And here uh, are some uh, some external uh, sources or the uh, codes and the survey papers related to uh, this uh, tutorial. And uh, interesting uh, readers can refer to uh, this, uh, these sources. And we want to thank the following uh, researchers to provide their uh, slides to us so that we can make this uh, tutorial. And uh, here are some uh, references. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. And we are very happy to uh, answer any questions if you have. And thank you for attending today's tutorial.